All right, we are live. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to host Johan Hennegraaf and Hilmar Gunnarsson. Johan is co-founder and product head of RQ and Hilmar is founder and CEO of RQ. I have been following RQ's updates on social media and all the product demos like were so exciting and inspiring that I had to invite them on the show to know about their journey, their product features, and how they develop this awesome product. So thanks a lot for being on the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Good to be here. So I'll go first with Johan. Can you share your professional journey till date and some highlights of it? But uh, it's an interesting one. Like I'm, uh, I'm an architect uh, myself from a background. I've been, uh, I think I graduated seven years ago about now. And um, like I've been always really fascinated and interested in uh, technology and, and use of uh, more advanced ways of designing and, and, and using 3D tools. Uh, I quickly went into BIM, uh, design automation, working with like making plugins for design work to help the designers. And that also got me into exploring VR as a design tool. And that's uh, about four years uh, how I met Hilmar. And uh, yeah, we decided to team up and uh, create Arcio, the, the product that we're uh, demonstrating today. I see. And was all the uh, learning of programming self-taught and what were the challenges in that journey? It's a, a good one. Um, so uh, there's in an in architecture industry, it's very uncommon to like have uh, like schools and professors that are very open to, to learning uh, like how to program and to use that for the design. So it's always been a bit of a challenge to kind of break the, the status quo and, and like <laughs> engage with your, your tutors about that. Uh, but the, the tips I can really give there is like, it's it's really valuable to, to do it because the future is, it's moving in faster and faster and there's a lot of uh, opportunities when it comes to uh, like automating how you design buildings and how you can actually uh, work with 3D geometry, within data, and, and parametric uh, geometry. Um, the most learningful things for me were like, because I've been doing this mostly self-taught, uh, just uh, get like something that you're good at. Maybe there's BIM, maybe you're, uh, you're handy with SketchUp, and, and you start with those programming languages and uh, just get examples from other people. And, and that's usually the best way to, to learn. You just get examples from others, uh, start researching more and more. Uh, for me, Unity has been very helpful in, in learning how to code. Uh, so I can definitely recommend Unity for uh, people. And yeah, when you feel a bit comfortable and you wanna learn more, go to hackathons, go to like, find more people that uh, know how to do these things. That's awesome. Uh, Hilmar, can you share highlights from your professional journey? Um, sure. So I think I actually started uh, playing with computers as coding when I was eight years old. Um, my first computer was an Apple II, which I guess shows how old I am. Um, so I was uh, like uh, playing with computers for a, a long time. I think I started my first company like 18, 19 years old, doing some uh, multimedia uh, stuff. Um, I kind of have been in the tech business for, for quite a while. I've uh, been part of a few startups. The, the last startup I, I did before Archeo was a company called uh, Modio. Uh, that was about enabling uh, people to be creative, uh, like design toys on their phones and iPads and 3D print them easily. Um, that was a, a great, a great experience. Uh, we ended up being acquired by Autodesk, so I spent two years at Autodesk, uh, and then I, uh, you know, I started Archeo. Uh, well, I guess four and a half years now. So it's it's amazing how time flies. And uh, unlike Johan, I'm not an architect, but I've uh, have a huge passion for architecture, and uh, this is why I, I love Archeo so much. It truly enables a new way to design buildings or pretty much to do any type of spatial design. So uh, that's kind of the highlights, I would say. That, that's so ad <clears throat> admirable. And I really like, like, so 
I had few uh, AC tech startups interview where people outside uh, architecture and construction are disrupting uh, our industry through cutting edge ideas. So it's it's really uh, I'm really happy to see that even people outside AC are interested to make an impact in AC and are developing products. So can you can you uh, share how was the first uh, meeting and discussion about RQ look like? What was the environment and how was the brainstorming session? Well, um, the, the, the very first meeting about RQ was actually a, a lunch meeting between uh, myself and our CTO, Harry, who's uh, been doing this with us now for a long time and was also part of, of my previous startup, Modio. We sat down at this restaurant in Reykjavik and I told him about this idea about kind of revolutionizing architecture design. And he basically looked at me and told me I was crazy. Uh, so that, that was kind of the very, very first meeting. Uh, but obviously we've had quite a few brainstorms, uh, you know, about Archeo over the last few years. And it was really interesting, like uh, when Johan and I met for the first time, uh, I had been following what he had been doing online. Uh, he was, uh, you know, doing something similar to Archeo and it just felt like we should get together and see if we could work together. And, and it was so exciting to see somebody uh, like from the architecture field, because neither myself nor Harry are from that field, to see somebody like Johan who's been thinking about this for a long time, just like, you know, saying instantly, like, you know, yes, this is it. Like, I want to be a part of this. Uh, so, and that obviously spawned quite a, quite a few interesting discussions about what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I see. And was there any like point where you had the in initial product vision and you had to pivot or make changes to the initial ideas to, uh, to, to where it is now? So uh, I will say that what we have today is extremely close to the initial uh, vision. Um, we always envisioned RQ to be this intuitive, uh, spatial, collaborative tool that would work both in VR and augmented reality. And what we have today has primarily been focused on using RQ in virtual reality, but the entire experience and the user interface has been thought from the beginning with augmented reality in mind, and also with using not only controllers, but just your hands to control what you do inside RQ. So, so that has kind of inspired uh, uh, a lot of what we do with, uh, with the product. But what I will say is, one thing that we did not pivot to, but we accelerated was the collaborative aspect uh, of RQO. Because uh, for, for a while in the beginning, we thought we would bring to market the product first with uh, like a single user modeling and then add later the collaborative part. But uh, as soon as we did some experiments with collaboratively working together in RQO, we just said, you know, this is it, like this just has to be like, this is the core of the product. And uh, when you're developing products, there's this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, saying that you should obviously just bring the minimum viable product to market as fast as you can. Um, for us, we could have shipped Archeo maybe even two years ago without some of the collaborative elements. But, but we just felt that this was so critical to, uh, you know, making Archeo a success that that's really what we wanted to bring in from, from day one. And there's one person that was talking about this a few years ago, and uh, I think uh, she kind of summarized this nicely, that really it's not about bringing to market the minimum viable product, but the, but the minimum lovable product. And, and we think the collaborative part is, is truly what will make people fall in love with, uh, with Archeo, even though you can use it by yourself, uh, you know, to do amazing things as well. That's, that's, that's great. Uh, Juan, uh, I must first admit that I'm really proud to see architect turn product uh, head because one of the thing I wanted on my channel is to more like product manager related review because it's a big step to have like from problem ideas to prototype to um, scalable product and how you incorporate like UI UX interviews and uh, morph the product. So, can you share some lessons learned from your journey? So I think this is for, for any um, 
like like any role that you develop into uh, regarding being a design technology specialist, uh, it often ends up in, in providing the right tools for the designers to, to feel comfortable with and to work with. And a really big part in that is already uh, making the user experience for uh, the majority of the firm uh, like, uh, understandable and, and workable. Um, so in, in the end, it's not that different. <laughs> there is, of course, there's a lot of differences when it comes to the day-to-day -day things you're doing. But in the end, um, the, the actual uh, experience that people have, the designers have, uh, it has to be as simple as possible. And uh, we cannot expect everyone to be doing all the coding, customization, uh, run Grasshopper Dynamo scripts. There's just a lot of people that don't feel comfortable with that. Uh, but if you can make it more approachable for um, like your office or uh, maybe in, maybe you make your own product or sort of uh, making it in the product and make it more easy to use, that will benefit uh, everything. And, and uh, when it comes to working in an architecture office and a software company, there are quite a few overlaps, actually. There are, uh, of course, you have the deadlines, they don't go for the uh, the physical projects they go for like shipping uh, like updates and releases uh, but the, the some of the focuses that you uh, are doing normally when when implementing uh, software in architecture firms that that's uh, like you still face similar challenges you need to communicate well you need to spec things out uh, properly and you need to have um, like like a long-term vision of where this is all going and, and just follow along that path. I see. And uh, can you elaborate on the product market fit uh, for Arcio? Like uh, for the initial idea you had, like how was the validation from the market? How did you conduct it, those user interviews and fit, got the feedback from that into your product? I think that <laughs> yeah. um, I think we we started showing Archeo to people probably within six months like uh, of starting to develop it. And uh, I always remember the, uh, the the first time we did that we went to Autodesk University um, and uh, showed it to some people at some you know very you know large design firms and. We pretty much at that time only had, it's not even like an alpha version. It was almost like prototype. It's like, you know, hey, we're thinking you're doing this and this is how you use it. And, you know, this is what we're thinking of doing in the future. And, and the feedback was right away extremely positive. Uh, this is something that people really hadn't experienced because uh, up until that point in time, and in many cases, even still today, like what people use VR for in architecture is to review 3D models that you do in other design tools, Revit, Rhino, SketchUp, Archicad, and so on. You just bring those into VR, you walk around, maybe you can make some notes, and that's it. So the, the idea of, of designing architecture in VR really hadn't been done, and, and Archie released the first tool to, to do that, you know, with a focus on, on doing that for architecture. So, so, so that informed obviously a lot of the uh, the subsequent development of Archeo, the feedback we got right from the beginning, because you know we are big believers in doing this, you know, with the community. We don't want to do this in isolation. Uh, we're trying to do something that really hasn't been done before, so we need a lot of feedback. And uh, many of the things you see in Archeo today, they have been inspired by these discussions with people in the community. So uh, that's kind of the. The thread that's been running throughout this, the, the feedback we've gotten from people, uh, you know, throughout these last few years. Interesting. And what's the current status of the company? Is it bootstrapped or it's like private or funded? Yeah. So it's it's completely bootstrapped. Um, we haven't taken on any external financing yet. Uh, obviously, uh, we'll, now that we have Archeo on the market, you know, we may start to look for some like financing maybe next year, uh, but we're not really in any, any type of a rush. And uh, the reason for why I decided to not take on investors uh, you know, you know, early is we wanted to give ourselves the flexibility to just do this the way that we wanted without any type of external pressure. Uh, and, and so far that's been, I think, uh, you know, been successful. 
obviously things have taken longer longer than we thought. You know, we thought that Archie would be on the market probably one year earlier than it was. Uh, we shipped version 1.0 this summer. And, and the big reason for that is that uh, this is this is simply extremely technically challenging to develop. Um, we have uh, developed our own uh, solid modeling kernels from scratch to make this possible. We're not using any type of third party uh, tools for that. And the reason for why we've done that is that uh, Archie has to run at 72 frames per second on a mobile VR device like the Oculus Quest. And you need to be able to not only place uh, 3D objects in the scene, which is not that difficult to do, but you are making real-time modeling operations like Boolean operations uh, at these frame rates. And uh, to do that, we, we basically had to kind of develop our own kernel. So even though Unity, uh, the Archeo is uh, developed inside Unity, we're not using uh, any of the, the physics uh, for our collisions or rate casting or nothing like that. It's all based on our own proprietary things. And again, none of the modeling, uh, uh, modeling stuff. So it's, it's, it's taken a while, but uh, we're pretty happy with the outcome so far. Yeah, now it totally uh, makes all the sense when I started why it was frictionless and within seconds everything loaded because you have a pretty strong engine. So yeah. that's amazing. I think this might be a good time to showcase a demo or get more into deeper aspect of RQ. Okay, yeah. let's do it. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I will be using the, the PC, like the desktop version of Arceo, and Yoan will be in VR. And this is one of the, again, one of the reasons for why it's taken a while to bring this to market is that we support not only VR, but also desktops like PCs, Macs, phones, and tablets even. So even though Arceo is developed from the ground up for virtual reality, we kind of brought it to, to flat screens uh, as well. So let me share my screen. Okay, so you see Archeo? Mm -hmm. Yep. So here I am seeing Johan inside, uh, inside Archeo. He's in VR and I'm on the, the desktop version. Uh, so uh, Mayuri, if you want to join us, you know, feel free to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can see that uh, Johan is doing some modeling. I can see in real time what he's really up to. I can continue navigating the scene as he's doing these things. I can even go into some of my, my edit tools. Let's say I'm going to my, my create tool, maybe place you know some props or, or trees here on this building like this, or some, some people. And uh, I can also start modifying the geometry that Johan is creating. You know, I can select, for example, this face here and you start to pull on it, you know, like this. Um, I can make new design suggestions if I go into my, my primitives and maybe select, you know, the cube primitive and boom, I think we should do something like this. And he, he sees this in real time on his end as well and can basically modify the design or do whatever he, he wants to do with it. I can do some, some sketching also. I can select my, my sketch tool and suggest to maybe add something that, you know, uh, here on this balcony, boom. And he can go ahead and place that. So it's a bunch of things that we can do to work together uh, in real time. Uh, and obviously what he sees in VR is in a way more interesting than what I see on my desktop because he can be fully immersed in the space and see it, you know, at, at human scale, essentially. Um, but uh, I have available in my desktop version most of the same tools that he has. So I have my sketch tool, I have my create tool, uh, I can paint things, edit them, I can move them around or, or delete and you know, affect the geometry in, in a number of ways. Um, maybe, Jan, should you show your, your VR view so people can yeah. see what this looks like from the VR point of view? See that? I'll share. Stop sharing my screen. This is awesome. I just want to say it. I love it. Good to hear. Good yeah. to hear. 
It will enable some powerful new workflows, so that, that's for sure. So I'm seeing my screen. Yeah, flashing yeah, a bit. <laughs> okay. So, so in, in VR, I'm using my hands to interact with the model. And uh, I can just enable my UI by opening my hands towards me like this. Mm -hmm. And this allows me to select tools if I want to change the, the various tools. Uh, but the, the real value actually comes from uh, interacting with your hands uh, with the 3D geometry that's in the scene. So what we see here is some 3D objects that got placed. I can just pick them up and, and move them around. So a bit of a... I think you, st you stopped sharing on the connection. Oh. It's pretty bad, I think. Yeah, I think there's something wrong with our connection. Yeah. Quickly change my settings. It wouldn't be a proper live interview without some technical challenges, but yeah. It, it looks it like your network in any case. So uh, maybe it's something to do with your network. Where is that? So should we maybe share your screen again? But make it a bit easier. Yeah, I'll just uh, I think we'll just stick stick with that. Yeah. Do that. So um, just to continue a little bit what we were talking about, uh, one of the key features of Archeo is that you can bring in geometry from other design tools. So for example, this tower that you have here in the middle, this is brought in from Revit into Archeo. So you can bring in 3D models from, uh, we have plugins for uh, Rhino, Revit, and SketchUp. You can also bring in uh, OBJ files from pretty much any design tool. You can continue to work you know, on top of those uh, models. And anything that you do here inside Archeo can be exported back out to these uh, other design tools. And uh, one of the key features that we've been working on for Archeo is this, you know, this bi-directional link uh, with these design tools. And especially in the case of Revit, we've done something that is really interesting. You know, all of the geometry that we create inside Archeo, it translates into a native Revit geometry that you can continue to work with. So you can bring in these, uh, you know, any massing you do, etc., into Revit and use the Revit tools to convert uh, these shapes to native Revit geometry, uh, walls, etc. Uh, you can like do the like the split into floors and apply facades and, and all of these kind of uh, these things that you typically do in Revit. So that's been a big emphasis of the overall kind of development of Archeo because uh, one of the main questions we got very early on is, you know, how does it fit into my workflow? So that's been a big, uh, a big focus for us from, from the very beginning. I see. And is it, uh, so the building was imported from Revit and we added geometry over it. So yeah. is it possible for you to showcase like how to manipulate uh, is it possible uh, to manipulate the geometry itself from Revit, like the windows or doors from the imported model? So, so currently, also the materials. Uh, sorry. Also the materials. So, so currently, um, we don't allow the editing of the native Revit geometry itself. You can add geometry to it, like on top of it. Uh, and then you can bring that into Revit uh, and kind of continue working with it there. And then as time goes on, we'll allow you to do more and more things with the Revit geometry inside Archeo itself. But, but uh, I should also say that we are not trying to, you know, recreate Revit inside Archeo. That's not the idea. It's all about uh, Archeo being almost like a collaborative layer on top of these other design tools uh, and making them you know, more uh, collaborative, and you can also create new design options more quickly with the context of your existing Revit models inside Archeo itself. Uh, we will be adding some interesting things to Archeo over the next, you know, uh, you know, six to 12 months, including creating your own components, etc., uh, which will allow you to do many things you can do in Revit, in Archeo even. But, uh, you know, uh, we for sure don't want to like uh, recreate uh, other design tools in that RQ. Interesting. Yeah. So on your back. Yeah, I'm uh, yeah. starting again. I think it's uh, it was a more than a 
internet issue. Like my entire PC was uh, doing some weird stuff. <laughs> okay, no problem. So I'm coming back into the meeting. So just while we wait for Jan to come back into the meeting, um, there are other things that I can do that are really interesting. Uh, I can use our views feature, for example, to jump around uh, the models. Uh, if I go into my views, I can go, for example, into this tower, and now I'm here on the inside. Uh, so in Archeo, when people are working together, they can create uh, these views together. Uh, if I create a view, Johan sees it instantly. If he does the same, uh, I see it. And you can easily bring people to your viewpoint, or you can jump to, to other users. And in this case, you can see how Johan is even here creating uh, some new design options here inside. I can go into my, my list of models. If I click here on my models uh, icon, and uh, let's say I want to create a design option here. I just duplicate this model. And Johan can start to modify this design in some way. I can also do that with him if I want, maybe adjust the, the materials or the size of the opening and so on. And then I can just simply like toggle between these different design options uh, here by clicking on the other version of the model. And this is something you can do also when you're in VR. So Johan can do the same. He can create these design options and, and take me through them. So we really focused on uh, making Archeo work really well as a collaborative tool and the feature to allow people uh, or users to bring everybody to them and to share these the views and to create these design options is key to you know, the collaborative workflow. I, I could foresee like uh, doing the initial design stages when currently we are limited to sometimes like current workflows are uh, Miro base or like other 2D based collaborative sketching and design manipulation. I think yep. I, this could enable real time options creation and design brainstorming like without any friction. It is uh, it is a truly powerful experience, but I, I will say that uh, what you see now on my screen when I'm looking at this in 2D basically, it, it really doesn't do this justice. Like you, you really to get the full appreciation for what's possible, you almost have to kind of look at this in, in VR because it is like a totally different thing to see something like this on a flat screen as opposed to just being able to be inside and just look around and manipulate things with, with your bare hands. And, and this is what I find uh, a bit uh, you know, interesting about if I just look at the architecture industry uh, and VR in general, uh, you know, a lot of people have started to uh, explore the benefits of using VR for the design process and to look at these models. But, but I'm still amazed at the, you know, you know, obvious number of projects that go even to construction without people walking through buildings before. Like nobody that is designing a building or like paying tens or hundreds of millions of dollars for a construction project should like green light any design before like demanding to walk through the entire design beforehand like why would you do that uh, and you can do this now with a headset like the oculus quest that cost 300 dollars there's like no reason for people not making this uh, an intricate part of any design and construction project today it's it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, i was wondering like because many there are like different cognitive uh, loads for people with different background about how they understand space so if uh, the the best thing i found about this is like it it's accessible for both with here with vr without vr so uh, everyone is on the same page and they are not like limited by the device and I'm wondering if you can curate a walk through the, through the building. So you showed us that using views, everyone can be called, but is there yep. a walkthrough we could do too? So, so basically, uh, you know, I can guide people throughout uh, any type of design using our, you know, pre-designed views essentially. So let's say I want to, you know, jump to the top of this building here. And I'm seeing something that Johan is doing. So I can easily go into my views panel 
and create a new view. And I can just like edit it and say it's view one, like that. And then I go into the other side here and I can be in a totally you know, different scale or whatever I want to be. And I create another one. So let's call that view two. So what I cannot do, like if you are with us inside uh, Arcio, oh, I see you're not there. So I'll just bring Johan to me. I can just click on this button here, view one, boom. Now I'm here and Johan is here as well. I can talk about this. I can use the, the sketch tool to highlight some things uh, on the geometry and then just go again. Boom, now we're in view two. So I can walk people easily through any type of a design. And uh, this can be really interesting for a number of different use cases. Um, we have seen people uh, use Archeo to demonstrate or to pitch new projects to clients and win new projects using this type of a presentation uh, capability. And we also seen people use uh, these views to bring their existing clients into spaces to walk through designs that are basically in, in progress. Um, th there was one uh, client of ours that used uh, Archeo to, uh, you know, bring, I think they had, you know, five Oculus Quest devices and they probably had 10 or 20 people like go to the construction site and everybody put like five people at a time put on, on the glasses and they just walk them through the, the design and they could go into, you know, the different rooms and so on, get a feel for the, you know, the, the design. So the, these types of curated uh, walkthroughs are very much, you know, a key part of what we're doing. Yeah, uh, if I may like say something, it would be, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, it would be interesting to have, like once we got, got those two views, yep. we know the camera angle. And uh, so if there is an option of generating like a clip from those and like, it linearly interpolates from one position to another and like have an orbit or like a walkthrough clip. That it is a continuous journey. That would be interesting. Yeah. Uh, I fully agree. And, and we heard that from some people that want to use uh, Arcu in that way. And uh, it's definitely something that's on our list because we think this can be such a powerful presentation tool uh, that uh, we really want to you know, get to that. Okay, uh, I, I, I am having uh, one question. So we saw the basic uh, primitive geometry morphing operations. Yep. Now, how, where are the objects of trees and furniture being imported? So for the, the basic uh, objects, uh, what we do in Archeo, we ship it with a basic library of, uh, you know, people, trees, furniture, and so on. Um, these are all objects that we have designed. Uh, you can place them anywhere in the scene. Uh, they've also been optimized for use on, on mobile devices. Uh, and we also created, uh, created the native Revit families so that when you actually export these to, to Revit, you know, they show up as, as proper Revit families. What you can then also do is you can bring in your own uh, you know, 3D models or props and place in the scene. So you can bring in your own chairs, uh, trees, or entire buildings and simply place them. Now, if I go to, to my import folder, uh, we have some examples of that, 3D models, Revit models, and so on. And uh, I think Johan has one pretty cool example that he can also maybe talk about. Johan, what do you have there? Yeah, so this is a module that uh, one of our clients, uh, like they, they loaded this in and they used this for uh, coming, uh, like making the compiled shape of the various models together. So you can see this, like the, some of the furniture that we have default in Archeo, but you can also bring in your own 3D furniture or people or whatever uh, geometry that you, you uh, want to have that maybe used to be a family. So I have here, like I just placed uh, a family of a chair in here. This one got exported with our plugin, and this will also come back to Revit as a as a family. So that that's how you could uh, extend the current library that we have with your own components. Amazing. And so let's see if if I import another object not from Revit. And when I export this, 
will that object be imported in Revit as generic object? Correct. So uh, like this, this would be a good example. This this model uh, got made and actually maybe let's just load some other stuff as well. So we have here, I think this tower, this one got created in Rhino, placing it over here. Uh, so the geometry that got imported from Rhino, it comes to RQ as a, as a mesh. And the, we know that this is an object. We know when we place two of those towers in the scene or uh, when we make it one of the towers smaller, uh, we know that there are two objects with two different sizes and we import them as individual uh, families uh, of these two towers because they're, uh, like if we would have two of the instances that are exactly the same, they will become two of the same families. But the mesh inside of that object, uh, that will remain to be a mesh when it's imported because we don't have control over how users bring in the geometry. Everything that got modeled in RQO, like this solid geometry that we just made here, that will be converted to a, a solid uh, Revit or native Revit shape or uh, other uh, shape from other design tools. So we try to, uh, like, like whatever we have as RQO geometry, come in as a uh, useful in the other design tools. Got it. Mm. When you were like uh, playing with uh, that uh, the model, I was just wondering, it might be an interesting if if one at, uh, imports like a office space or an art gallery and then various options are displayed uh, on that, uh, let's say a portrait image, which has interactive 3D model of various uh, design options or something. So it's, the, it's definitely interesting to, to think yeah. about, uh, you know, scenarios and, and user interfaces like that, because uh, when you do this in virtual reality, it truly allows us to create a totally new like user interface paradigm. And, uh, that's been one of the uh, the things we've been focused on from the very beginning. How can we use this this spatial nature, uh, you know, uh, of the medium to to make the interface and the experience uh, so that it it's most you know intuitive as possible. And and I'm really excited about you know showing people what's what's possible with even adding more you know example scenes uh, and allowing you to kind of explore your libraries and so on more kind of in a spatial way than just like in a you know in flat grids uh, if you will got it and uh, can one manipulate the sun angle absolutely you want to do that for us Johan? yes uh, let me just move this tower over here and move some sun around. Johan is producing a lot of design options when yeah. we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing around. <laughs> so you see, um, like the, the shadows change, and this is actually uh, happening based on the location that got set. So we see the map that got loaded in here. This is actually open street map uh, data that got imported for this site. And we, we adjust the sun long, uh, latitude, longitude to, to uh, fit that side. So the sun study fits directly the, the side. I'm amazed by all the features you have. Do we have some night mode, like we put lights and stuff? Uh, I can't turn it on tonight, but we don't have lights yet in our show. Like we cannot add uh, lighting in our buildings. <laughs> it's it gets pretty dark at night, as you see. <laughs> yeah. Like we can have a, a little uh, dramatic sunset and then uh, work in that environment. Maybe. And and the reason for that why we don't have uh, things like you know lights that you can place at arbitrary locations is also due to some limitations on the you know the mobile platforms. Um, you know it's computationally very costly to have a lot of different you know real time point lights. But but this is something that we very much want to uh, you know address in the future because with the with the modeling kernel we built uh, we built in in such a way that uh, it can allow to accelerate uh, those types of you know geometries and and lights and things like that because we built the scene up in a way that we know 
how everything relates to something else, what is inside of something else, etc. So our goal is very much to allow you to do things like add lights and all kinds of more complex things, you know, in the in the future uh, to the scene, even on mobile devices. I have a question here, like when we are talking about like we can export it in Revit. Can we export in other things? As I was seeing on site, uh, we can do in SketchUp and Rhino. So what yeah. all um, what extensions we can export in? So uh, we have the the Revit connection is the most um, like the, the most developed version. Like it has the, the full models that come from Archeo will be converted to native uh, geometry. The the Rhino and SketchUp plugins also allow you to bring the scene from Archeo back. Uh, we convert things to Rhino components, so they are uh, like in, in that system uh, useful. And we plan to add something similar for the, the SketchUp uh, plugin. But it is already um, like everything that got modeled and got added in Arcu is all able to go back into uh, SketchUp. The current version. But uh, I, I'm thinking about the uh, iOS and like mobile version. So how does the compute and storage happens in those like? Let's say if the model is heavy, is the mobile version more for viewing and adding and not storing? And there would be some desktop client who would be storing the model. So what we um, envision and, and how we recommend people to use the, uh, the clients is that the, the Mac and the, um, the PC version of Archeo, they are ideal candidates for uh, also using the plugins because it's, it's uh, easier to move files around and, and you have a bit more uh, computational power there to, to bring these models in and out. So we, we really recommend people to use those platforms for bringing data in and out. Uh, it, it is still possible to also bring your model directly into uh, iPad or into an Oculus Quest, for example, but it will take a bit longer. And as these devices are uh, more limited uh, computationally, uh, they cannot handle that many polygons in those those uh, models. So uh, we, we always recommend people like based on the meeting you're going to have that that will set uh, the size of your BIM model that you want to uh, bring into, and also how you're going to uh, you know, be able to uh, work with all sorts of devices. So you, like the ideal situation, we uh, you just load a big model as big as you can, and you, it run it runs on the phone, but there's uh, no uh, app that can currently do that. It's uh, you, you need to think a bit, okay, this is my device that I'm going to plan to use and you pro uh, uh, prepare the scene for that. Got it. And uh, is uh, like hosting on cloud or web-based in on your radar? So currently everything is stored uh, locally on the device to device. So uh, there is no cloud in our, in our case. Uh, it's device to device, fully encrypted uh, sharing. And uh, this is also an interesting uh, yeah, security model because a lot of uh, clients are a bit uh, skeptical about uh, the, the, the cloud, uh, like having persistent mm -hmm. cloud data, but we are uh, also looking into having a persistent cloud. So these meetings uh, don't need to happen in real time. You can set something up, like maybe I made something for Hilmar. I can send him a link and he could join that same space at any time without me being there uh, in the same time. I see. So the way it works is the person who starts the model will create a room and that room link will be sent to all the other viewers or collaborators. Yes, so ultimately, so all those people are accessing the model through that link, like going to the internet and from internet to the local. Uh, so model. yeah, so the, the, the person who first joins that meeting, they, they he becomes a host or she, and they, they share like the encryption data with everyone that has the right room uh, name and password. Uh, only then you can access the, the data that is on the local device and can decrypt it. And uh, what we're thinking of adding is uh, a more uh, persistent space where you can also just prepare a model for other users to join in later. 
because now the, the host still needs to be in that meeting if you want to share that model with others, because the, the device to device um, like setup we have now. Yeah, you guys have like pretty robust security for the product. That's, that's awesome. And if I were to ask uh, five years from now, how do you see RQ? Like what? I'm curious to know your thoughts. That's a, that's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, first of all, I think five years from now, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality will be much more widely used, just general, uh, for a lot of different use cases. And it's really interesting to see the, uh, how rapid the progress is when it comes to the, these devices today. Uh, you know, the, the device uh, that we've been focused on a lot over the last few years is the Oculus Quest because it's a truly standalone mobile device. Uh, and we, we see how much investment is being put into these devices by the big technology companies, be it uh, Facebook, or I guess we should say, say Meta now, yeah. <laughs> uh, by Apple, by, by Google, by Microsoft, and so on. So it's important when you think about RQ in five years to think about you know, not this type of a device, but a device that is a lot more capable than this and a lot lighter than this, you know, and more comfortable to use for longer periods of time. And, and what I find is when people think about these kind of technology advancements, first of all, everybody thinks that uh, things will happen faster than they really do. Like it always takes longer. But, but uh, the, there also comes a point in time where like everything just shifts and something just becomes widely adopted very quickly. You know, the, the iPhone is a good example of that. You know, we had smartphones for many, many years before the iPhone. And then they just bring the iPhone to the market and something just magic happens. And it's a device that everybody has in their pockets now. So, so I, I think VR and AR are heading, you know, down that path because of the rapid or the increasingly rapid advancements that are happening. And that will enable people to do a lot of amazing things. now. For, for Archeo itself, what we have today is just the tip of the iceberg of what we envision. Uh, we have, you know, we brought Archeo to the market now version 1.0 with kind of the, these base capabilities in place in terms of modeling, collaboration, and so on. And our vision looking like five years and beyond is that you will be able to do amazing design work inside Archeo, truly and truly with your hands as if you're just sculpting buildings. And there will come a time and we start to see some of that now where people are starting to say, I did something in Archeo in 50 minutes that would have taken me two, three hours in Rhino or a day in Revit. A week. <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, and that's really what's inspiring us. And when somebody can go into Archeo in VR and within minutes or an hour or two, can become like uh, fluent at using the tool compared to putting somebody in front of a flat screen design tool and say, well, you need to go on training for a few weeks to do something. Um, that, that just, I think, shows the potential of where this is heading. I would add to this, uh, the, the potential is also uh, like the, the disruptive nature it can be in the, in the workflow of the uh, designers themselves, like how we typically work it's, it's working with versions and making with hard copies and working towards like making something that is static. And then the big red marker comes and like we start messing up, like with that new ideas come and we go back to the drawing table. That, that process itself, if we can make it more interactive and collaborative, uh, it will reduce uh, design um, like feedback loops from, from months. It can reduce it back to days if you do this well. That's awesome. And I, I'm wondering, like, if, if I had found this tool during my university days, I could see, like, during the initial stage, I could uh, create different design options and uh, feel the proportion and aspect ratio through the VR headset instead of, like, a 2D interface, and that's very powerful. So I'm wondering if it, it would be awesome to have, like, a feature of different presets 
and layout for visualization. Like, okay, I created this option. Now I can quickly scroll through what are the different filters and like have like a production ready graphic. Definitely, I think there's a, a lot of like what we have now is, is looking at the design from uh, just the 3D view. You can do something with the sun, you can have sections and uh, analytical modes. Uh, but there's, uh, I think there's a lot of lenses that you uh, should be able to look at the design and, and ideally we add all of them. <laughs> so it's just, uh, let's see how far we can come in those five years. And, uh... Awesome. And do, do you... Uh, currently have or like plan to support like Bayesian curves? Uh, the interesting question. Uh, <laughs> we we want to start with uh, the components first because uh, what you saw me doing, like creating some of these more rounded shapes, that already shows a bit what you can do with, with segmented um, components and that work a bit uh, like smarter. Also, we uh, we built ArcGIS uh, like a rapid prototyping tool and we already start getting more and more people like hey you wanna okay when i'm trying to design my house like this this corner does this and so people already start using it for more detail and components are the most uh, needed in and going to that level of detail awesome uh now i'm curious to know your thoughts on metaverse oh. <laughs> well, the big uh, big question yeah. <laughs> Um, well, what I would say is, uh, I think it's completely fascinating how much, uh, you know, importance, uh, you know, meta is putting on, on, uh, you know, building out the metaverse. Uh, the, the presentation we saw last week, uh, was, I think very, uh, in many ways inspiring because it shows that they've been thinking about this a lot, um, and they clearly have some, some, you know, grand plans for, for building out the metaverse. Um, it's 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 obviously completely unclear at this point in time how this will play out. As you know, they said themselves, you know, uh, how what exactly the metaverse will be is still a very big big question. But uh, what uh, I think is the most important takeaway from this is all the work that's going into building the various components of what you could call the metaverse, uh, and also how people are using you know virtual reality already today. You know, people are using VR to get in shape using some of the, the fitness apps. And they are, are getting, uh, seeing, uh, you know, uh, better results using those uh, apps than some other methods, for example. You know, people are using VR to work together, to socialize. You know, VR chat is, a, is an amazing community and they're doing all kinds of amazing things there. So in many ways, like the metaverse already exists in some shape or form, even though it's not this kind of interlinked uh, kind of collection of worlds you can like jump between. You know, Rec Room is another example of a fantastic app and like a social uh, experience that uh, is, is amazing. So uh, it's unclear exactly how this will play out, but uh, the components being put in place and the headsets being developed to enable this will, I think, lead to some amazing things. Uh, but again, if you look back at, at how technology has, has developed, if somebody would have said when the first like, an iPhone was introduced that we'd have something like TikTok or Snapchat or Uber even, you know, they would just have laughed. You know, it's like, you know, you, you would have been crazy. Why would people do that? Why would they exactly. do that? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and, and you know, I, I'm so old, I don't even yet uh, still understand why, why like images disappear on Snapchat. yet. Like, why would you do that? It's just crazy. <laughs> but, but it just goes to show that trying to predict the future uh, is, is challenging. But putting in place these building blocks so people can build on top of them and start to take this in very unexpected directions. I think that's the most uh, amazing thing here. And we expect to see the same thing with Archeo. You know, we talk about Archeo today for architecture design, but reality is you can use it for any type of spatial design. And we already started to see people using it for game design or theater design, you know, theme park design. We started to see people use Archeo, you know, consumers, not just professionals. So maybe in the future, Archeo will be more used for like virtual architecture and not physical one, who knows? 
interesting what about you hoan like uh, do you have any thoughts to add on how about metaverse yeah i think the metaverse is going to uh, it will have in some shape or form uh, an important uh, part in what we can do uh, i think like elma said there's already quite a few metaverses out there and uh, if it if it's up to big tech they are all controlling the the one true metaverse I think in reality will be a lot of worlds to choose from, a lot of platforms to choose to go into these metaverses, and uh, it will just be a, 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 a like a, tra a transition from going from our 2D uh, screens and interfaces into 3D environments where we can use the AR glasses that we're going to get uh, to engage with some of the models. And like in, in the AC industry, this will mean a lot of things can potentially change because the, the limitations of um, the current uh, tools, like the, a lot of the tools that were built for making design drawings, uh, they can be changed to augmented reality and virtual reality applications that, that in, in this use these 3D models because basically that's what it is, 3D models and data in a lot more efficient way. You see, and like one of the thing I like, I find very good in the gaming industry is the, the experience and the workflow. So like RQ gives me some uh, vibe about uh, gamified design workflow and more interactive and playful way. But yeah, and I think uh, maybe our industry needs more and more such kind of gamified um, building modeling. It would be interesting. So. What we... would be very welcome indeed. Like, <laughs> it's a, some of our tools are a bit uh, like a static <laughs> when it comes to, to doing things like a design. So I think it's very uh, welcome. And it's, it's also not something to be embarrassed for. It's something, something can be playful. Why, why would you make uh, work uh, hard? Like, why would you make Revit hard? Like, <laughs> I think mm -hmm. no one does it for a reason. It's just, uh, but, but you. Uh, the more you can make something fun and playful, the, the easier people will be able to use it. I see. And uh, what will be your piece of advice to architects and young professionals who are interested in AR, VR, and want to develop disruptive workflow or cutting edge tools? You want, you want to say that? that? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I would say whatever like we have, in, in our current workflows, you really have to think a bit outside the, the box here because the, the 3D interactions and interfaces, they allow so, like, in, in so many new ways, uh, possibilities of using uh, tools. And, and I think Arky is a good example because uh, typically where you have, like we invented on our screens, uh, little widgets to make uh, translation movements or, or fill in uh, like square, uh, like rotations that you're going to do. Like you can just pick it up and move it. Like why, why would you need all that interface? Uh, like you can really think of completely new ways uh, to do things with these uh, immersive uh, tools and experiences. And, uh, that's, I think, where there's also a lot of potential there. Like you just can uh, look at some of the existing workflows that we have and think of like how, how would that work if we would use spatial uh, interfaces and uh, these glasses? How, how can we actually extend what we have? And also, like, uh, how are you going to, you know, introduce this to multiple architects like are you having any community or something like that or any tutorials or you in person you know teach those whole firm the idea of vr and designing in vr because that's pretty new for the whole industry correct and it's actually it's a bit challenging as well because it's uh, so new that people don't fully understand yet the, like how easy it is to get like a quest for 300 dollars and uh, like to get started um, the what we're going to work on also in the next few months is, is making the, the onboarding a bit easier in the app because we've been focused so much on getting the product uh, just out there as a, as a version one that the, the uh, like the way you get introduced to the app and how everything works and, and just educate people about uh, these are the VR devices you can use uh, that also needs a bit of love to, to make people understand how easy it is to get started with these tools.
No, this is just uh, getting a chance to talk about it, you know, in, in you know, yeah. uh, sessions like this is, you know, it's priceless. Like yes, anything it's always good. We, we can do or you can do to help us spread, spread the word uh, be, because people, you know, they, they don't really realize what's already possible today. You know, this is not science fiction. It's just something you can do by yourself. And we need to. We need to just get that word out there uh, as a community in general. You know, what are the, really the benefits of, of using something like this? And what really helps us there is also seeing some of the, the usage of Archeo. Like, it's really inspiring for us to see actual designers talking about it. And we had uh, like a live event about that, uh, I think it was one and a half month ago, where one of our architects that, that's using it in Ireland that showed us some of these projects. and. I think that's also inspiring for other architects to see like this is something you can already use. It's already like it helped him in his design process. You could uh, like all of that uh, like general awareness is very important, but also seeing other people use it and it's already uh, like in a, in a state that you can start with it. Yeah. And so are you also going for it? Go ahead. Go ahead. So are you also ha planning to you know like have a in person support? you know, a team of training people so that you can just, you know, say, okay, this person so-and-so can contact you and stuff. We always do that, actually. We, like, uh, if people want to know more or they, or they want to meet us, uh, we, we can plan a session with them in Archeo and just show them the ropes of how, how things work. And that's actually a, a nice, like, probably the best way of learning Archeo and about Archeo is just being there with me and there and the, <laughs> show you how things work. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking like a few of the products which uh, in our university people got onboarded easily was they provided like free licenses and free version and the professors recommended that too. So it might be an interesting thought if you could reach out to university and get them onboarded right during the early career stages so those people can champion the product later. Correct. And uh, we already got quite a few universities using it. And if people want to uh, learn about that, so just send us an email because we offer free licenses for them. And uh, we see it as a, like an important part also for, because collaboration in universities is, has been also staggered a bit by uh, last year's uh, challenges. And um, like having tools like this also helps uh, the teachers and students to, to connect in new ways and work with uh, some of the tools that we already have. Awesome. And do you uh, plan to release API or if other tools want to integrate Archeo Engine in there? Is like any thoughts? So uh, we have received, uh, you know, few requests around to something like that. Uh, it's something that uh, we will consider for sure in the future. Uh, we know that a lot of architecture firms, for example, are using you know, Unity or Unreal to do all kinds of you know, custom projects. And we could envision kind of tying RQ into those, like in those game engines, essentially. Uh, it's not something that's on the immediate roadmap. But uh, we see that as a big part of Arsq in the long run because uh, we want this tool to be as, as open as possible uh, in a number of different ways, not only to bring things into Arsq and export out of Arsq, but also just to integrate it into your other workflows. So it's for sure kind of uh, on our longer term roadmap, yes. Awesome. And, uh... I want to know from both of you, like, how does a day in your life look like? Very hectic. Yeah, it's very <laughs> hectic. <laughs> Short answer. Uh, like, it's it's um, it's 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 really fun because there's it's like it's completely new. So there's always some like new things to explore and, and new things to uh, to make and do to to like uh, discuss. Uh, it, it is still a startup, so things are hectic, uh, but. Um, it, it's really uh, interesting also to, to speak to like industry leaders, students that are already embracing this because they're all really excited about this. And it's it's really fun to like find people that think like you, like, right? It's, uh, like you probably experienced this yourself when, when having the, uh, like these sessions. Like it's, it's really um, inspiring and it also motivates to go on and to make it even better and, and, and really use that user feedback also to make the, the product that we 
uh, we'll all laugh uh, one day. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, you know, we are a small startup. We are now uh, eight people scattered throughout kind of the world. Uh, uh, so people have to perform a lot of different roles, obviously, as in any startup. And, and now we are shifting increasingly from focusing just on the product to also focusing more on kind of the sales and the marketing part, um, which is obviously a, a big step. But, but um, we are also starting to take a look at expanding the team. So, uh, it, you know, maybe great to mention it here that if there are some people out there that are interested in joining us, you know, please do get in touch. Uh, we are looking for people that have experience with development for, you know, virtual augmented reality. Uh, people that are like uh, passionate about, you know, UX experiences in these types of uh, tools. But, but also because of the, the, the core geometry engine we are developing, uh, we are looking for people that have some, uh, you know, experience with working with computational geometry, uh, BSP trees, you know, rendering optimizations and, and all of those uh, very tricky things. Mm -hmm. So anybody that is interested, uh, you know, please, please do get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. All right. It's out there now. People will, yes. will reach out to you. Awesome. So uh, before we end the interview, I have this last segment called Rapid Fire. So I'll ask questions and you'll have five to 10 seconds to answer it. And first Hilmar will go and then Juan will answer it. And you got to keep it short, like a few words. And uh, let's, let's, let's do this. Is it possible to say pass if we don't have an answer? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not an option here. <laughs> wow, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, first question is, which city is in your travel bucket list? Um, uh, I would say Rome, uh, because I love it. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to go to San Francisco because I never actually been there. And like this, as, as a techie, I feel like, oh, I need to go. <laughs> Silicon Valley. Yeah. I see. Awesome. Uh, your favorite movie? Uh, I would have to go with Dune because it's so amazing and <laughs> I just saw it. Like crazy. If you haven't seen it, go see it. I like Inception a lot. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, uh, a book that made a big impact in your life. Uh, I need more than 10 seconds for that. Sorry. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, one book that made a big impact. Uh, I think uh, maybe I would say the three body problem because I also read it within the last year and it's, it's, it's mind blowing in many ways. And I think for me, the one from uh, Chef, I don't know his full name anymore, but the one from the Homo, homo Deux, the, like where the humankind is going after all this mess we're making on the earth. That's for me, like pretty inspiring. I know <laughs> that name, even I'm lost. Yeah, now. like it was like, <laughs> even, I know, it's, just, it's really like, a, it's a really good Sapiens. one. Yeah. So, so you have Homo sapiens, but then there's Homo dei. That's about the like where we are going next, so where the future, future of human humankind is going. Interesting. And anything you wish you would have done differently in your life? Uh, the answer is no, because uh, my philosophy is simple: that if you are happy with where you are at this point in time, you can't regret any past uh, decisions you made. Yeah, uh, I would say in, in like during my architecture education and after, I sometimes felt like uh, I wish I went full on computer science, uh, but I'm actually happy I did this path in the end because it got me to where we are now. Um, so I, I think if you're not happy with something, uh, think about it twice and you know, like a, a bit more and maybe make a change to because it's never too late to learn. There's always there's a lot of ways to make your tree of life go all sorts of ways. I see. And what is one thing that excites you? The future of spatial design. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think. Um, yeah, me, me, I would say the like where this is all heading and 
that we're able to to work in a lot more uh, like this will be hopefully change the the design environments that we have around us for the good because a lot of the things that uh, we see going wrong in the industry today is caused by by stupid little miscommunications in software or like deadlines that cannot be passed and, and like all sorts of weird little things so we just hope that this can really bring like a general quality among uh, the designs and hopefully a lot of places in the world. Awesome. And any conference or event uh, that can help one to keep up to date with the trend in the VR and AR, MR industry, XR industry? Yeah. Well, we are taking part in a conference a week from now called the Next Build in London, which will actually showcase a lot of uh, great, great uh, tech. Um, a lot of uh, VR kind of AR stuff, so that's definitely uh, one place. Yeah, I would add to that um, built uh, like the Digital Built Environment Institute. They have really good conferences on uh, like, um, uh, generally AEC technology, and um, I do think there's also a lot to be learned about with general game conferences uh, because the gaming industry i think there's a, there's a lot of uh, they're always a bit ahead when it comes to ux ui design and how to uh, make things that are uh, addicting and interesting to to keep using and now like it's 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 a general question like any hackathon uh, which you found is interesting in, to meet like-minded people in this space? Um, I think the, like the, the one, there's like this built, uh, oh God, what was it called again? There's this, this hackathon that gets uh, old in various places around the world, which I think the biggest one, the AC, but I forgot the name. Like I went to one of them. AC hackathon, just AC hackathon. That one, I think, is the best way to to meet likewise uh, like people with the same building uh, interest and background, interest. but also try like to look at some of the interesting ones for for gaming because if you're a bit familiar with Unity or Unreal, uh, you can actually learn a lot by some of these developers that are in those teams, and often they are a lot more. Uh, like a bit more advanced than some of the people from the AC industry because it's actually their job to code. So there's a lot of things to learn from, from those people when you team up with them. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, my final question is, uh, we covered a lot of things in this interview. It was very insightful. So is there anything else uh, you wanted to say or communicate? Well, the, the main thing is that Archeo is now available. Um, we do have a free version that anybody can uh, you know, use to try it out uh, and get a feel for what's possible. Uh, and like we said before, we really are interested to hear feedback from the community. So we would just urge everybody to try it out, get it for your VR headset or just your PC, Mac, phone, whatever. And you know, let us know what you think. Um, what what can we improve? What can we do better? What's working well? Um, that's really what we're here for. You know, we're here for the the community. Awesome. Oh, and you wanna add anything? Nothing to add to that. Like, uh, <laughs> please please download it. Get go to our website. It's free. Uh, like, there's a also a two week trial version where you can try the the Revit and Rhino plugins for yourself. And uh, yeah, like the, it's, it's easy to get started. So just uh, <laughs> try it out and give us feedback. Yeah, and I must comment, like it took less than a minute for me to install it and enter a room. So it, like the, the product like has a great engineering as well as UI UX experience. And I, I believe in it. So great development first and like congratulations for this amazing product. Thank you very much you. and thanks again for having us here. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice rest of your day. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.